Let's go ahead and take our Bibles and turn to the last book of the New Testament. The last book of the New Testament, the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ. Revelation of Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter number 14. Let's go ahead and stand for the preaching, for the reading of the Word of God. Revelation chapter 14, and we're going to begin reading in verse number. All right, are you there? Say amen. amen. All right. Verse number 9 says, and the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship his beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patient of the saint. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire and cried with a loud voice to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in the sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. I want you to look at verse number uh, 10, and I want you to notice the expression where the Bible says, The same shall drink of the wine, now notice the next three words, wrath of God. And then if you would look in verse number tw uh, 19, at the latter part of the verse where the Bible says, and cast into the winepress of the, the next three words, wrath of God. And for a few moments this morning, I want to preach on this thought, the wrath of God. The wrath of God. Now let's pray and we'll get right into the message this morning and ask the Lord to do a work in our hearts today. Brother Doug, would you pray over the preaching of God's word? Yes. Watching over this morning. Amen. Advance forth that as we drift through the uh, hours of our day, uh, what we hear will be able to hear and to glorify you with that in our lives. Thank you for that. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ, we spent uh, some amount of time, I would think it's probably been two years where we did a pretty much a verse by verse study of this book and it took us a long time to get through it. But I, I love the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ because when you study this book, this is a book that is given to us not just to satisfy the curiosity that we have concerning end time events. Although it is a prophetic book and it deals much with prophecy, but that's really not the purpose of this book. The purpose of this book is to reveal to us who Jesus Christ is. And there are so many today that really have a false view of 
who Jesus Christ is and who God is. And in fact, the Word of God talks about another Jesus in, in, in the Word of God. And so when we come to the book of the Revelation, we find that in the first few chapters, uh, chapter 4 and chapter number 5, God begins to give us a description of Jesus Christ. And chapter number 1, he, he begins to show us who Jesus Christ is. And the book starts off with the revelation of Jesus Christ. It reveals to us who Christ is. And when we come to chapter number 12 and chapter number 13, we find that God begins to deal with with what's going to take place in the tribulation. That actually begins back in chapter number 6. But in chapter number 12 and chapter number 13, we begin to read about the characters of the tribulation. We begin to read about the nation of Israel and, and, and Satan and the Lord Jesus Christ and the archangel. But when we come to chapter 13 and chapter 14, we begin to deal with the Antichrist and the false prophet. And I want you to look in chapter number 13... And I want you to see in verse number 1 what the Bible says here. The Bible says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. And when God begins to deal with the Antichrist, He calls the Antichrist a beast that come out of the sea. And then when you get to the latter part of chapter 13, beginning in verse number 11, He talks about another beast coming up out of the earth. And so God begins to describe the beast and, or the Antichrist and the false prophet as two beasts, one coming up out of the earth and one coming up out of the sea. And when you read down through chapter 13, look at verse number 14. And look what it says. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. And verse 15 says, And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And look at verse 16. And he causeth all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand and in their foreheads. And boy, you begin to read through chapter 12 and chapter 13, especially chapter 13, and it gets a little bit heavy. I mean, it gets a little bit, you know, if you're not prepared for it, it'll get you a little bit down. It'll get you a little bit low and discouraged uh, because we read about those who are going to worship the beast and take the mark of his image but when we get to chapter number 14, 14 is kind of like the rainbow after the storm. Chapter number 14 shows us that even though there's going to be anarchy and chaos on this earth, we're reminded of the fact that God is still in control. And I'm glad to know that. I'm glad to be reminded about that. And we find the reason why God is still in control is because chapter number 14 reminds us of this wonderful and great truth that God always judges sin. And I want you to look at chapter 14, and I want you to look at verse number 10. And the Bible says, and shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. I want us to look at this subject and this idea of the wrath of God. And the Bible talks about all those who take the mark of the beast will suffer the wrath of God, not only on this earth, but will suffer the wrath of God in an eternity of the lake of fire. And so for just a few moments this morning, I want to talk a little bit about God's wrath. And the first thing I want us to see is the recipients of God's wrath. Look at verse number 10. The Bible says, the same shall drink of the wine. Who's that referring to? Well, back in verse number 9, it says, if any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. I want you to notice that here in this passage of Scripture, God is describing the unbelievers. God is describing those who take the mark of, of the image of the beast, either in the forehead or in the right hand. And the Bible says that if you take, during the tribulational period, if you take the mark of the beast in your right hand or your forehead, the Bible says that you're going to suffer the wrath of God. In the latter part of verse number 10 it says, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Ultimately, we find that God's wrath will be manifested in the lake of fire. But I want you to notice how God likens his wrath, or I should say how he describes his wrath. In verse 10 he says, The same shall drink of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture. Now think about this. I'm so glad we're saved. Amen? I'm so glad we're not going to experience God's wrath on this earth or in hell or in the lake of fire. 
But the Bible talks about the recipients who receive God's wrath. The Word of God gives us a picture and He says, the wrath of God is, is like a cup that is being poured out. It is like a, it's like a, a glass of wine that is being poured out without mixture. And, and they, they, uh, they receive God's wrath as a cup that is poured out and the entire cup is empty. And so God begins to talk about the wrath of God being poured out, but He also talks about the severity of God's wrath. Look what it says. It says, uh, the, uh, the, the Bible says, shall drink of the, of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture. In other words, God's wrath is like a glass of wine that has not been diluted. When God pours out His wrath, it will be unfiltered. It will be undiluted. All of his wrath will be poured out. Now, when you go back to chapter number, excuse me, when you go forward to chapter number 16, look at verse number one. It says this, and I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your way and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. If you want to see what God's wrath is going to look like on this earth during the tribulational period, begin to read chapter number 16 and God pictures His wrath like a vial that is being poured out on this earth. God is going to empty out His wrath on this earth. And so He talks about the the recipients of His wrath. He talks about the severity of His wrath but I want you to understand something about the completion of God's wrath. Go to Psalm chapter 75 and hold your place because we may be coming back in Revelation chapter 14. But Psalm chapter number 75, and when you get there, say amen. Psalm 75. Look what the Bible says here in verse number 8. Look what it says in verse number 8. It says this, For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red. It is full of mixture, and He poureth out the same. But the dregs thereof, all the wicked of the earth, shall wring them out and drink them. When we read about the wrath of God in Revelation chapter 14, God was dealing with the severity of God's wrath. And we know that the wrath of God is very severe. And boy, uh, you read Revelation chapter 16 and all the events and the details that are going to take place. I'm so glad that we're going to be raptured up out of here before any of that happens. Uh, But when you think about the lake of fire and you think about hell, and you think about God's severity of, of His wrath and fire and brimstone and torment and darkness and unquenchable thirst... But when we come to chapter 75 of the book of Psalms in verse number 8, God is teaching us about the completeness of God's wrath. All of the wicked one day will drink the cup of God's wrath. So complete will God's judgment be on the wicked that the dregs, those dregs are are the the settlement, the, the, the residue of the... Uh, of the um, of the wine that settles down to the bottom, God says that the dregs will be pulled up and they will be wrung out and they will be ingested by the wicked. God says the wicked will ingest it all. God teaches us something about the completeness of God's wrath. But I want us to also think about the justice of God's wrath. You know, we live in a time where the idea of God's wrath is scoffed at and ridiculed and mocked. And people often look at the Bible and say the Bible is an intolerant book. People look at God's Word and God Himself and they say that we believe that religion, that truth, excuse me, should be inclusive of all religions and yet we know that the Bible is exclusive. If something is right, that means something has to be wrong. And if you want to know the time, you have to, if you have two different clocks, they say two different things and you don't have any time at all. And so for something to be right, something has to be wrong. And people have set themselves as judges over God's character and question if such wrath is just. Many preachers do not say anything about the wrath of God, the judgment of God. In fact, when was the last time we heard preaching on hell? It used to be when I was growing up in the 80s and the 90s that preachers were preaching on hell all the time and we don't even hear the word mentioned anymore. People are afraid of it because it's an unpopular view to view God as a God of wrath. 
Many preachers today, and you look at the Joel Osteens and the people that are on TV, and they talk about the grace of God and the mercy of God, and I'm glad to know that our God is merciful, and our God is gracious, and I'm glad to know that He will forgive, and I'm glad to read and, and to study about the love of God. But those things should not be preached without uh, alongside of it being preached the truth of the fact that God is holy and God is just and God is a God of wrath. You cannot believe the Bible and you cannot believe the God of this Bible if you deny the fact that He is a God of anger and He is a God of judgment and He is a God of wrath. In fact, I truly believe that you cannot under, understand and appreciate the love and the grace and the mercy of God without coming to understand the holiness of God. And we would not be true to God's Word if we did not preach on hell and we did not preach on judgment and we did not preach on wrath the God of the Bible is a God of wrath. But here's the thing about God's wrath. God's wrath is a just wrath. Now that's not true of you and I. Anybody ever seen a man act out in wrath? You know what the Bible says in the book of James chapter 1 and verse number 19? The Bible says that the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. In fact, we know that all throughout the Word of God that God warns us about, about giving over to the passions of wrath. But God's wrath, and the reason for that is, is because man's wrath is an unjust wrath. A man's wrath does not accomplish the righteousness of God, but God's wrath does. And God's wrath is always directed towards sin. God's wrath is a holy and a just wrath. His holiness demands justice. And if God was not just, He would not be holy. And if God was not just, He would have no wrath. And His wrath is always the divine response towards sin. And I want us to realize from the Word of God that God hates sin. In fact, the Bible teaches that sin is an abomination to God, that God abhors sin because of the holiness of God. God cannot endure sin. I want you to go to Romans chapter 2 for just a moment, and I want us to show you that the wrath of God is, is perfectly legit and perfectly just. And God is just in showing His wrath. And the problem, my friends, with sin is not the holiness of God and the justice of God. The problem with sin is, is us. Is that we sin. And look what it says in Romans chapter 2 in verse number 5. We'll read verse number 4. It says this, Or despisest thou the riches of His goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. But after thy hardness and impotent heart, notice this word, treasurous up unto thyself wrath. You know what the word treasurous means? It means to adding up. In other words, uh, because of man's sin, we are adding up unto ourselves wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. And so the Bible is teaching that the punishment fits the crime. That one day that God is going to execute His wrath. In verse number 18 of chapter 1 of Romans, it says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. God in His proper and appropriate response to sin is wrath. God hates sin. And God will execute His wrath upon sin and upon the sinner. And God will judge the sinner one day. For the Word of God says in Psalm 89 verse 14, justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. And because God is just, and because God is holy, and because God can never um, uh, overlook sin, He will judge it. And the Bible describes the wrath of God it's like a cup that is filling up. And when the cup is filled up, God is going to pour out His wrath because God is holy and God is just. Now think about it. Would you want a God who was not holy? Who was not just? We have the privilege of electing our judges in our society today. How many would like a judge who would allow rapists to go free? How many of us would like to have a judge who, who allows child molesters to walk away free from their crimes? How many would enjoy something like that? 
How many of us would like to have judges who would pardon mur- or who would, who would uh, not sentence murderers and the criminals of this world? None of us would like that. We want to see justice being uh, uh, meted out. And thank God we have a God who's holy and just and righteous and will not allow sin to go unpunished. God says something about the severity of God's wrath and the importance of God and the completeness of God's wrath. But I want to show you something about the importance of God's wrath. All right, so we're done in the book of Revelation. Go back to the book of Genesis chapter number 15. Genesis chapter 15. And when you get there, say amen. Genesis chapter 15, and I want us to begin reading in verse number 1. And in Genesis chapter 15, the emphasis is on the land of Canaan and Abraham and inheriting the land. And look what it says in verse number 1. The Bible says, And after these things the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childish and the childless, and the steward of my house is Eli- uh, Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto them, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I inherit it? And he said unto him, Take me an heifer of three years old and a she-goat of three uh, three years old and a ram of thine uh, of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against another. But the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcass, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them, and shall afflict them 400 years. Now look, all of this passage of Scripture is talking about a seed that will be given to Abraham, and from this child, a people is going to come forth. And when we get to verse number 13, he says to Abraham, he says, that thy seed is going to be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and they're going to serve this land for 400 years. Now, do you know what God is prophesying? He's prophesying about Israel being in the land of Egypt for 400 years. And notice what happens in verse number 14. He says this, And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward they shall come out with great substance. And so we know that the land of Egypt was judged, and the people of Israel came out of Egyptian bondage into the wilderness. And the Bible says they came out with great substance and all of that took place. Now look at verse number 16. But in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again. Now look what is being said. Now think with me. Abraham is being told that for 400 years his people will be in bondage and oppression in the land of Egypt. But after 400 years they're going to come back to the land that God gave to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And that is exactly true. But have you ever wondered, why did God allow Israel to be captive in Egypt for 400 years? Why not 300? Why not 250? Why not 500? What was it about 400 years? Well, notice what it says in verse number 16. It says, but in the fourth generation they shall come hither again. Now notice, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Y'all see that? Now do you know who the Amorites were? The Amorites were one of the uh, pagan nations that dwelt in the land of Canaan before God gave it to Abraham. And God says, you're going to be in Egypt, and you're going to be in Egypt for 400 years, but for 400 years, do you know what God was going to do to the Amorite people? He was going to show them mercy. 
He was going to give them a time to get right. But he says the, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. In other words, there is going to come a time when the iniquity of the Amorites is full and God's judgment will be poured out. There is going to be a time where there will be no more mercy, where no more grace will be extended, but God will pour out His wrath upon that people. Well, Israel did go into Egypt. They were there for 400 years. They were in the land of the, they were in the wilderness for 40 years, and after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, they came into the land of the Amorites. And do you know what happened? Turn, turn forward to Joshua chapter number 10. Because in Joshua chapter number 10, what was prophesied in Genesis chapter 15 is being fulfilled in Joshua chapter number 10. And look what it says in verse number 1. When you get there, say amen. It says this, Now it came to pass when Adonizedek, the king of Jerusalem, had heard how Joshua had taken Ai and had utterly destroyed it as he had done to Jericho and her king, and as he had done to Ai and her king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them, that they feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city as one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai, and all the men thereof were mighty. Wherefore, Adonizedek, king of Jerusalem, sent unto Hoham, king of Hebron, and unto Piram, king of Jarmuth, and unto Jephiah, king of Lachish, and unto Debir, king of Eglon, saying, Come unto me and help me, that we may smite Gibeon, for it hath made peace with Joshua and the children of Israel of Egypt. Now look at ver uh, of, of Israel, excuse me. Now look at verse number five. Therefore, the five kings of the what? The Amorites. The five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jermuth, the king of Lachish, the king of Eglon, gathered themselves together and went up, they and all their hosts, and a camp before Gibeon, and made war against it. Drop down to verse number 7. So Joshua ascended up from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into thine hand and there shall not a man of them stand before thee. Drop down to verse number 11. And it came to pass, as they fled from before Israel, and were in the going down to Beth Haran, that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Azekah, and they died. And there were more which died with hailstones than they with whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. The Bible says in verse 12, Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Now notice what happens, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Agilon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemy. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and hasted not to go down about a whole day, and there was no day like that day before or after it, that the Lord hearkened unto a voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. You know what is happening here? 400 years has gone by, and the nation of Israel have come back into the promised land, and, and we find that Israel goes to war against the Amorites. And God, by using the nation of Israel, has poured out His wrath, has judged the Amorites of their sin. He pours His wrath like a cup that is being poured out. And God's wrath is so important to Him that He'll bend the very laws of nature to perform it. You know what happens? There's a day that takes place that is recorded into the Bible where the Bible says there was no day like that day before it or after it where God says that during this battle He causes the suns to stand still. He causes the moon to stand still because in this battle uh, they were running out of light and God made it to where the children of Israel had light so they can complete the victory and destroy the Amorites. And what God is teaching us is that His wrath is so important to Him that He will bend the very laws of nature nature so that his wrath will be poured out you see my friends God's wrath is important to him I'm reminded of the story of Noah and you read about 
Noah, that Noah was a preacher of righteousness, and for 120 years he preached the righteousness of God. And I can imagine a group of people coming by Moses every day who had never seen rain. And Moses is building this ark, and he's laboring on this ship. And imagine the scoffing and the criticizing that takes place, and Noah warning his kinfolks and his friends about the wrath of God, and the day when the cup of God's wrath will be poured out, and God will judge this world with a worldwide flood. And I can imagine that as they scoffed and mocked and, and laughed at him, I can imagine what was on their faces when the day of God's wrath finally came. You study the Bible, there's a number of ways in which God pours out His wrath. Sometimes God pours out His wrath with a flood. He'll never do that again, a worldwide flood, but he did it in those days. Sometimes he uses drought and famine. Sometimes he withholds the rain. Sometimes he uses natural disaster. Sometimes he uses the sword and uses war. Sometimes he uses other nations uh, uh, to bring in captivity. But when you go back to our text in Revelation chapter 14, the ultimate experience of the wrath of God is the lake of fire. You know, the Word of God is very clear that those who die without Jesus Christ as their Savior will be sentenced to hell by Jesus Christ as their judge. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Every single person who denies the Lord Jesus Christ and refuses to accept Him as Savior, the Bible teaches they will die and go to a place called hell. But hell is not the final place for the dead. The Bible tells us that one day that death and hell will be cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. When you study about hell in the Bible, you'll find that hell is a real place. It's not an imaginary place. It's a literal place. It's a place of no relief. It's a place of torment. It's a place of fire and brimstone and darkness and no water. It's a place that is forever. It is a Christless eternity. It is a place of remembrance. And my friends, when we think about hell, we ought to think about our friends and our loved ones that are without Christ that will go to this devil's hell if we do not remind them and tell them and confront them about their sin and the remedy for their sin is found in Jesus Christ. But as we think about hell and we think about the ultimate expression of the wrath of God, I want you to think for just a few moments on how much God loves you. You ever thought about that? How much God loves you? How valuable you are to God? You ever thought about how precious you are in the eyes of God? You ever thought about how much Jesus Christ loves you? I want you to go to a verse of Scripture. We're almost done, but I want you to turn over to Matthew chapter number 26. Do you know that God loves you so much that He would send His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer His wrath in your place. Look at Matthew chapter number 26. Look at verse number 39. You remember what is taking place. Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane and verse number 39, the Bible says, and He went a little further and fell on His face and prayed saying, O oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from Me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as Thou wilt. You know, I, I read a lot. I try to read a lot. I don't read as much as I used to. And I've read what commentaries have to say about this particular verse. And I remember when I was a younger man, I wanted to identify what, what does it mean when Jesus about, says, let this cup pass from me. Some people feel like it's referring to the fact that he will go to the cross. And some people think that it's a reference to the fact that he will have sin laid upon him. I don't know, I'm sure some of that is true and some of that is accurate, but what I believe the cup is referring to is the cup of God's wrath. Because the Bible says in Galatians chapter number 3 and verse number 13 that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. Because God is holy and God is just, sin must be paid for. And if you and I do not accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, the only way that we can pay for our sin ourselves is by, to, is by dying and going to hell and staying there forever and ever. And so because God is just, sin must be punished. And if God was not just, there would be no demand for His Son to suffer and die. And if God was not loving, there would be no willingness for His Son to suffer and die. But God is both just and loving. 
and His love is willing to meet the needs of His justice. His love is willing to meet the demands of His justice. And so do you know what God has done for us? God has provided Jesus Christ to suffer our wrath and our hell for us. In other words, God loves us so much that He sent His Son to die and to experience God's wrath in our place because God is not content to show wrath no matter how holy and just He is. God wants to show mercy. God desires to show His love. Therefore, He sent us Jesus Christ. Friends, do you know what that means? That means when, when Jesus Christ was dying and suffering for our sins, Jesus Christ suffered the very wrath of God. The wrath of God from heaven was poured out. We know that Jesus certainly suffered at the hands of men. He suffered at the hands of sinners. He suffered at the hands of soldiers. But He also suffered at the hands of God. Because Jesus was on the cross, He cried out and said, My God, my God, why hast Thou forsaken Me? And for uh, for six hours on the cross, the wrath of God was poured out upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus, when He refers to this cup in the Garden of Gethsemane, He was referring to the cup of God's wrath being poured out. And turn to Romans chapter 3. And two more verses of Scripture. Romans chapter 3 and verse 24. Look what the Word of God says here. Look at verse number, we'll back up to verse 21. Romans chapter 3, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all that believe, for there is no difference. Verse 22 blows Calvinism out of the water. Verse 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Verse 24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remissions of sin that are passed through the forbearance of God. Verse 26 says, to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Now wait a second. You say, Pastor, I thought you said at the beginning of the sermon that the wrath of God is God's divine response towards sin. That the wrath of God is His judgment and the appropriate response towards sin and sinners. So how can God be just and justify sinners and forgive them of their sin? How can God let a sinner like me and a sinner like you into heaven and not show forth His wrath? The answer to that question is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the cup of God's wrath was poured upon Christ in our place so that we can be, go- so that we can be forgiven and be set free from our sins. In other words, Jesus Christ suffered as our substitute. Now think with me now. Look what it says in 1 John. I'll read it to you. You don't have to turn there. But in 1 John chapter 4, here's what the Bible says in verse number 10. 1 John chapter 4 verse 10 says this. Here in His love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. The word propitiation just means satisfaction. Jesus Christ was, was the death and the blood, the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ satisfied the just demands of a holy God for our sins. And here's what I want you to think about. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, did Jesus just divert God's wrath? By Jesus Christ dying on the cross, did He just cancel out God's wrath? Was the wrath that came upon the Lord Jesus Christ, was it somehow in some way diluted? Was it some way and somehow less severe? No, my friends, the Bible says He was made to be a curse for us. Jesus Christ suffered all of God's wrath so that we don't have to. The greatest message that any preacher can preach 
is the fact that, yes, God is a God of wrath, but His wrath has been satisfied in the payment of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I remind everybody here that there's not one person in this world who has to go to hell. Every single person can be saved, not because of what who we are or what we've done, not because of good deeds or good works, not because of religious, uh, religious things that we do, not because of who we're born from, not because of the family that we come from. We can be saved and forgiven from our sins because of what Jesus Christ did for us where He suffered the wrath of Almighty God so that we can be forgiven.